I finished the semester at school, uh, didn't start the next semester um, um, in Burke County school system because in February, February 2nd was when I was going to have my, my transplant. So I actually went to um, back to Duke uh, in the middle of January and started the whole T minus day 11 again. Um, did chemotherapy, uh, double radiation once in the morning, once in the afternoon. Um, unlike the way they do radiation these days where they pinpoint areas, I had total body radiation. I, my whole body was the field. Um, so other than getting a really nice tan, um, you know, I was leaving my radiation, going back to my, my hospital room and throwing up for a couple hours and getting chemotherapy, couple, throwing up for a couple more hours. Then um, going back and getting radiation in the afternoon, throwing up a couple more hours, and then at least for the rest of the night, I had the rest of the night off so I could kind of relax, my body could re relax. And um, So we ended up doing the transplant. Uh, we ended up make, making it all the way through to the transplant, had the umbilical cord um, stem cell transplant. My transplant actually came from an Asian baby um, and, and actually came out of the, the bank in New York. Um, right now there's a Carolina cord blood bank um, now, but um, and then a lot of that's part of... Um, my transplant stuff like that helped to allow that to happen. Um, but my transplant came out of New York. And so for, and, and we were actually in the, we were actually down in Durham for a hundred days after this transplant, not just 40 days. I was in the hospital for about 45 days, but I actually had to stay in Durham because, um, since I was the Guinea pig for this, since I was the first person in the world over 40 kilos to have it and survive, or at least to have it at the time, we had to stay down in, uh, in, in Durham and I was over at the clinic every day. Well, the last six weeks I was there, they allowed um, me to go home for the weekend. So I could go home to the weekend and see my family, see my friends and stuff like that. So that was pretty awesome after being away from them for so long. Um, Although, I mean, we had wonderful experiences. I mean, we, uh, I, uh, when, I, when I left my transplant after 45 days, I actually stayed in the Ronald McDonald House in Durham. Um, they had four bone marrow transplant um, apartments. And so I could stay in like a little, my own little apartment and not have to worry about being around people um, because my immune system was so low. Um, we used to have sororities and fraternities and people that would come by and bring food. Like every Tuesday night was like McDonald's night. So McDonald's, the local McDonald's would always feed all the families and stuff there and stuff. So. We had lots of great experiences. I had, I had like a back door to my apartment where my mom could drive up and pull the car and I could get out into the car. Um, I remember this one was a lot tougher. My body took a lot more lot more hit, um, at least from the muscle atrophy and stuff like that, just because I think it was just that I'd had that transplant six months before or eight months before, or actually it ended up being about 11 months before um, my second one. And then my body, I think, had just taken so much of a hit that it was so weak and stuff that um, I remember it, I ended up having to, I was trying to get out to the car one day to go to the clinic and get in my mom's car. And I remember I had to pull up, pull myself up the stairs, like four steps just to be able to get, I, could, I couldn't walk, I couldn't step without having to hold on to something to pull my, use all my strength to pull myself up. So um, I knew that the, the recovery on this one would be a lot longer. Um, but we we went through the transplant we had all these things um everything went really really well um we couldn't we can't we couldn't complain at all i mean other than having nine iv boxes hooked up to you at once and um one night i woke up and one of my lumens had kind of undone and um didn't realize it and i was walking to my bathroom because in my in my hospital room i had a bathroom and a shower they're all in my room or all connected to my room and i did my dad was in the, one of those comfortable hospital recliners that they put next to you. Um, and I didn't want to wake him up because I'm sure that, you know, as, as uncomfortable as that recliner was, he finally was asleep. So I didn't want to wake him up. So I was kind of tiptoeing to the bathroom and just kind of noticed that there was some water on the floor. Didn't really think anything of it because back then, you know, IV bag would leak or something like that. Or, um, you know, there was no telling what it was, but I just didn't want to turn the lights on and stuff like that. So I get to the bathroom, um, doing my thing, turn the light on, and I see these like bloody footprints. And these little bloody footprints are following me. And I look down and they're my footprints. And I turn the light on and like my blood is like all over the floor. And so I'm sitting here thinking, okay, well, we're not gonna panic because panicking is only gonna cause more panic. So um, my dad's still asleep. So I hit the nurse's button and I said, yeah, um, um, Kelly, um, one of the girls that she'd actually been a nurse for me during my first transplant as well. She, uh, she gets on the phone and, um, this is probably one or two in the morning 
and, and she gets home the, um, the little thing with me and she goes, uh, what's wrong? And I said, well, you might want to come down here and you might want to bring a couple pints of blood with you. And she was like, what do you mean? And I said, because mine's all over the floor. And, you know, I'm very calm, you know, very, I'm holding it together, you know, just, you couldn't help but laugh at something like that. You know, you couldn't help but just, I mean, there wasn't anything to get upset about. It wasn't anybody's fault. You know, just one of those things that probably came and hooked when I was asleep. Um, so she comes down there and my dad's up there and they're all like just panicking, running around. I'm sitting there laughing because like, you know, just chill out, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm alive, you know, we can put more blood in me. We'll be okay. You know, y'all you know, relax a little bit. You're going to make me more nervous if you keep acting crazy. So there was a lot of different things that happened and stuff and the way our family handled it and the way the nurses reacted to things. But we, uh, we ended up, um, finished everything. We, we, we finished all the stuff down at Duke. Um, I mean, I was swollen from one end to the other. I looked like big bird. I was jaundiced. My bilirubin, um, your, your bilirubin, I believe is supposed to stay below like 0.5 or something like that. Mine was like an 11.5. So, I mean, you know, I'm on the edge of liver failure and, um, I, I, you know, my whole skin's yellow because I'm jaundiced because of my liver issues. And, but, you know, medications, um, I was on a horse medication or what we, what we called a horse pill. Um, but it was a, um, it was a steroid and, um, the steroid was there and to help the, the transplant to reject anything. Um, but it affected my nerves. Like I would, I would, I, like I was in a room, it was like 85 degrees in that room and I was shivering. Um, I'd have to have blankets and stuff. They'd have to turn, like people couldn't come in my room cause it was so warm in there because my body, my internal temperature was just so, so low because of this, those, because of the, that, um, that, uh, um, hormone that they had put in me or that I had to take. And I had to take 800 milligrams in the morning, 800 milligrams of the night of this hormone, um, that was causing all these negative things, but the positive side of it, it was helping my transplant and helping, you know, my body grow. Um, it affected my nerves to where I would, I could hold a spoon. And by the time I got the spoon up to my mouth, there was no more longer any food on it because my hands were shaking so much. Um, we had, uh, I couldn't swallow the inside of my, the esophagus of, of the, um, the inside of the lining of my esophagus had peeled. Um, I couldn't swallow. So, uh, you know, I couldn't eat. My taste buds had died for two months. Um, everything that I ate tasted like apple, uh, tastes like applesauce without the apple flavoring. So it just tastes like mush in your mouth. Um, one of the positive things about that is where my love for spicy food and sour stuff comes from now because they would feed me spicy and sour stuff to try to, get, to, try to basically get my taste buds to come back quicker. Um, we knew that my taste buds would leave during... Um, the second transplant because they did the first transplant, but just the second transplant they left for a little bit longer. Once taste buds start coming back, you know, start gaining weight and stuff, and I gained a lot more weight in the in in the hospital than I probably should have. Um, but a lot of that's so you're not able to exercise anything like that. You know, you're trying to get weight back in because for a while there you're only getting fed by IVs um, and, and and liquid nutrition. You're not necessarily because you can't eat, you can't swallow. Uh, I used to have to take um, uh, the little ice cube trays and we'd pour Gatorade in them and put um, toothpicks in them and make like popsicles. But because my electrolytes, I wasn't swallowing anything. I wasn't able to drink anything. I was just getting, you know, food supplements and, and IV supplements. I would take the, um, the ice cube and I would roll it around in my mouth. And as it melted, it would roll down my throat and help to cool my throat and soothe that and stuff. We used to take, um, we used to take uh, washcloths and get them wet and then put them in the freezer so that I could put them on my head and let the cool water just roll down my head and cool me off at, you know, when I was not, when depending on, cause my body would change from hot to cold to hot to cold. I mean, um, I totally understand what women go through when they talk about the hormone changes and things like that and hot flashes and all that stuff. Because I mean, I wasn't having to the degree that someone would post menopausal or something like that, but I was still having a lot of these body reactions and, and temperature changes and, um, all these other things that I had to basically, I mean, I had, uh, I had my blood pressure. I was on blood pressure medicine and, um, all these other medic, I was on medications to help counter the medications that I was on and, and, you know, and had all these different, um, IVs that were hooked up to me at once. And when I walked around with it, it was like walking around with like your, your, your best friend, your, your, your mechanical person. Cause there's like nine boxers or eight boxers or, um, sitting on this machine that you're pushing around with you and stuff. So it's, it's almost to the point where that machine and those things weighed more than I did. 
Um, and I'm sitting here pushing around to do my daily walks and stuff like that because I always wanted you to exercise and um, and get out of bed. And we try to do as much as possible, but you can imagine, you know, on a day of just doing nothing but throwing up or um, I was on so many painkillers and stuff because of my lining in my throat and because of everything I was going through that my days would turn into nights and, you know, because I was asleep during the day because I was on painkillers and I'd get to nighttime and I couldn't go to sleep because I'd been asleep all day long. So they're, you know, trying to shoot like liquid Benadryl into you to try to get you to go to sleep or a sedative or something to try to get you to sleep. So you have all these things and then when you finally leave and, you know, you come off these pain medications and your body's actually, you start to feel more of the pain because the pain meds aren't there anymore. And, um, but then, you know, is, is they slightly wean you off of it and, and, and we were able to leave and get into the apartment and stuff like that. And I wasn't as, I didn't have any treatments. I would have some, um, some of the IVIG stuff um, while I was down there, but uh, more or less it was kind of like going by, checking on my, my counts and stuff like that. Uh, I had, you know, swollen feet, swollen hands and all of that is just trying to, you know, the, the more you exercise, the more you get active and stuff, a lot of that, your your body will release it and stuff. So. Um, I remember going back to see my friends one day and um, they were actually having a pool party over at um, one of my friend's house and um, went there and like five people passed me that were like really good friends of me and had no clue it was me because of the, because of how much facial weight I had gained, um, um, not having hair, how much weight um, I had gained. And so, but they, but my, 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 my friends were awesome. I had several friends that came down and saw me down at Duke while I was having my transplant and stuff. And, and several of their parents, uh, would bring them. So it was, uh, you know, it was other than, you know, we went, made it through those, those transplants and, and made it to the senior year. I ended up um, having to take a semester off, um, of, of high school because my immune system just wasn't strong enough to get back in. So I was actually homeschooled, um, for a couple in order to catch back up. Well, what we decided was that we decided that there was no chance, there was no reason for me to push myself to try to graduate with my class. I could graduate a semester later. So I actually entered my senior year. My, the first semester of my senior year was actually the second se semester of my friend's senior year, the class that I was in. So I actually started my, spring, my, my senior year in the spring and ended up in the fall. So we actually ended up getting a um, medical hardship from the North Carolina High School Athletic Association so that I could play football again that following year because my goal was, once my transplant was over, to be back in the gym. Well, within probably, I'd say about a month or two after my transplant, or after I had been released from Durham, I was already back in the gym squatting 300 pounds, doing, doing you know, just back trying to become me. Um, I used to look in the mirror and wonder like when I was all this facial weight and stuff coming off, but the more I worked out and stuff, the more it just came off every single day. Um, I got my body back in shape. My mind got back in shape and everything. The focus was get back in school and, and stuff. Cause I still had all these goals and things I wanted to do. I mean, I was, um, even though I was having these transplants and stuff, I was still being, you know, I, I had several football scholarship offers, um, you know, a lots of different things. And, but whenever it came to, um, Back in, I guess in, in um, I graduated in December of '97, so the second transplant was in '96, and in, in February, actually February 2nd of '96, um, was down at the hospital for 100 days, came home for a couple months, um, went into uh, had that whole next semester off. '96, it was pr pretty pretty cool because um, one of my buddies was on the football team, asked me actually to to escort his girlfriend to homecoming because we all played football and so we weren't we couldn't escort anybody but since i had the semester off i was kind of like a um the assi honorary assistant coach for the team um so he had asked me so that was pretty cool so i got to experience you know that's something that most football players at least in our high school didn't get to experience um so we did that and then um the next semester i started school and and, and we started everything and um got back into the swing of things in school and figuring out oh my god how much have you forgotten you know i mean there's you don't retain a whole lot of education and stuff other than, you know, when I read my labs, I used to read my, um, every morning before my doctors would come in and do rounds, I would have already read my, my file to know what they were going to come and talk to me about. So it wasn't something they never surprised me on anything. I always, cause there was several times they'd come and look for my file and it's actually in my room on my lap when they would come over because they would always come and grab your file and then go, talk to people and then they come around rounds and explain it and stuff. Well, they always have to come into my room and grab mine because I always had it and I was always reading it because I wanted to know exactly what they were talking about. Even though I didn't understand a lot of the words, the more I read it and the more I got used to it, the more I, I could understand it and follow what they were talking about. 
Um, so a lot of that kind of just kind of pushed me. I just wanted to be back to Travis. I just wanted to be back to the normal. I wanted all this stuff to be put behind me. Um, even though I knew that it would never, I could never put it behind me for good. I knew that it would always be a part of my life. Um, I just wanted to get back and, and, and have that goal. I mean, I had a goal from my first, my second transplant was that I would graduate high school. 